in this unknown environment. So for that, we have our gliders who are capable of sampling, of getting the, the value of this feature once you know or wherever they are. So we can, we can sample the region, but usually we don't have enough time to sample. Sampling may have a cost, or there might be a limit on the number of samples. We can do. So we cannot like have a perfect, perfect uh, mapping of the whole region. So in imagine our case, we're trying to locate, for example, the deepest point in, in the caldera or the place in which the temperature is higher. So a maximum point, a minimum point. So we can have some strategies to sample in which, uh, given this limit on the number of samples, we end up having a poor estimate or being far from this being the closest uh, the closest sample to the optimal one is actually too far to get a, a good estimate. So here we have to ask a question, how can we design these sampling policies to actually, given this limit on the number of samples, given this sample budget, we can get good estimates on, this, on these optimal points. And second, if we have more than one glider, more than one problem, how can, how can we benefit from that? So. Let me show you the running example that will be throughout this whole lecture. So uh, we will be focusing on locating um, seafloor depth, and we will be focusing on locating the deepest point in the region. So we are using this uh, this old area with two with two valleys. Actually, the deepest one is this top right one, and. Uh, our goal is to find this place as soon as possible because we want to use the remaining time to take pictures of the seafloor uh, live there. So we'll be referring to this example throughout the lecture. So let's go to what sampling. So sampling is improving our understanding of the world, so of a certain feature of the world. And in our case, uh, via sampling, we will be increasing our kn our knowledge about the, the depth of the caldera region. So we need to consider three things. So we have a, our robot, our glider has a physical state. So it's not, um, it has a volume, it has a position, a rotation. So we have to take that into account when uh, designing our sampling policies. Second, the robot has a, a model of the world. It's its information state. So it's kind of the knowledge the robot has about, about in this case, the, the depth of the ocean floor. And finally, the robot has a, the sampling policy, which is uh, the policy that tells the robot what to do next, where to go next, where to go sampling next, which trajectory needs to follow. So we will explain now how to model the world, decide when to sample, and how to improve this model based on, on the samples we take. So imagine we are uh, in this initial position in the bottom right corner. So we are in a single agent case. There is only one robot here. So imagine um, we are in this coordinate, S1, Y1. This will be our physical state. We could have a more complex physical state and take into account our orientation. Also have the Z coordinate there. We will have this model right now. Um, and the robot, based on, takes a sample here in this point one and has a specific information state. So how it works. Then the robot moves to 42 coordinates 2 and takes another sample. It updates its information state. Again, based on this update, it decides that it wants to go to this position 3, its, its physical state changes, and its information state changes. And finally, Based on that, decides again, OK, now I want to go to, to this position 4. And the update it gets from the, from the sampling uh, it kind of improves its information state. So how can it decide where to go, where this trajectory is kind of? So there are different ways, different methods of deciding these trajectories and these sampling policies. So there are two big groups, which is fact fixed strategies, adaptive strategies. And now I'm going to tell you with like two examples of each one. So fixed strategies are these strategies in, wi in which the sum, in which I don't, I don't take advantage of the samples I get during the wait. So 
before I started sampling, I already know which will be my, my path. So I know, okay, this will be my path. So there are two examples here. The first one is fixed patterns. Use pattern standard, so just the lawnmower pattern, we all know. So in which case I might be interested in, in taking this strategy. So for example, instead of wanting like the deepest point, I want to map everything. So I want complete coverage of the surface. So this is a complete search. You go through all the environment. Um, you also need, I mean, in this case, you don't need a time constraint. So you, you want to make sure that you have plenty of time to do it. And you don't like have a, a high cost for sampling. Uh, finally, actually, it's also good if you're kind of dealing with a needle in a haystack problem. <coughs> Just imagine you want to find like a treasure chest in the bottom of the ocean floor. So this way, I mean, you cannot have any kind of, you cannot benefit from where's not the, the chest. Basically, you need to, to cover everything. So uh, I'm going to show you an example of how, so in the left, you have like the truth, uh, ground truth of how the, the seafloor is. And on the right, you have kind of the model, the robot has the information state. So this is the belief of the, the, the model the robot has while it's doing the more pattern. So in the beginning, you can see, OK, so maybe the deepest, the deepest point is around this uh, left area. But OK, I finally, in the end, I realized there was a deeper point there. So the second type of fixed sampling strategy is the informative path. So what's informative path? Imagine that you have some sort of information about the region that might not be directly related to, to the feature you, are, you want to locate, but I mean, your, the surface vessel has first covered the region and provides you with information about other features, such as, for example, the temperature, you know, the current flows. So you can design kind of an, object, an objective function, which based on that, you design a path that in which you want to maximize that objective function. For example, in, in, in this case, imagine these, these orange regions could be regions of high temperature, which if you go directly into them, uh, it would damage your, the glider uh, hardware. So you want to avoid them. Um, so if you have this kind of information, this, this might be a good strategy. And also, you, if you have like a few robots, it could be also a good strategy. You cannot have multiple robots, because otherwise, you have to solve like uh, a lot of optimization problems, which might be infeasible uh, given the computational resources. So it's a good strategy for if you, when you have other information that you can exploit and a few robots. So now we move to adaptive sampling. So adaptive sampling, as opposed to fixed sampling, is when you do actually you make use of the information you get along the way to decide where to sample next. So this is motivated. So again, OK, this, you might think it requires more computation. Yes, it does. But it's worth because actually most of the features that we might think of are actually spatially correlated. So many environments are described as continuous. Uh, ocean, ocean depth, uh, ocean floor depth, this one, and um, many discrete phenomena occur in clusters. So, what does that mean is that if I take a measurement somewhere, I know that what a measurement somewhere nearby could look like. So that's the point: taking advantage of this information on when deciding uh, where to sample next. So, the first strategy that would fall in this category is adaptive replanning. Adaptive replanning is, is the same case as um, informative planning, but you allow to replan your trajectory along the way after taking a sample or after taking a couple of samples. So um, this has the same advantage of uh, informative planning. You have uh, an objective function or you have other information, you can make use of that. The problem is the, this uh, strategy when applied to multi-agent case, requires a lot of communication. Because once, I mean, you have to solve an optimization problem and resolve that problem for many robots. And then you have to make sure that these robots don't interfere. So uh, it might be a strategy that requires the, the highest amount of communication. Finally, 
what happens when, for example, I don't have information at all about the environment? So I don't even, I mean, I, maybe the vessel, the vessel hasn't provided me with, with information I can use, or, or I'm starting from scratch. Uh, so in this case, by using a sampling, it's a, it's a good strategy for that. Um, the using of this sampling work by basically the the robot has a kind of a prior belief about how the the ocean floor could look like. So based on that belief, the robot decides where to sample next. So it starts taking samples, and the the how a Bayesian adaptive sampling works is that every time you take a sample, you update your belief. So this is a good strategy to find the global optimum. It's also a very good strategy to have multiple robots collaborating because you require less amount of communication than adaptive replanning. So in this case, you don't have to communicate your computer trajectory. In this case, you are, in, you are only communicating and computing a, a point in, in, your, in the ocean floor. So uh, it's kind of less, uh, less co computationally less expensive. So now I will hand it over to Rajat, uh, who will introduce you more to infor information today. Hi. Uh, so now we that we had a quick overview of uh, uh, di uh, different kinds of sampling, adaptive sampling, and fixed strategies. Uh, let us dive a little deeper into how do we model these scenarios. Uh, in particular, how do we model the information state? Uh, how do we update uh, when every time a new sample comes? And uh, um, probably that will you know, get us to a point where we can actually give a adaptive sampling algorithm for most of these problems. So let's consider the, pro the picture that we had. Uh, we had this caldera uh, example which in which we have to find the deepest point. And uh, there are two valleys, and one is deeper than the other. And we need to uh, get to the deepest one, not to get uh, confused with the shallower uh, valley. So the uh, robot or the glider uh, moves uh, 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 along from 1 to 3 to 4. Uh, in doing so, it changes its physical state, uh, and uh, which is the position, um, velocity, whatever. And it also has an information state, which is its view of the world. And every time it gets a new sample or gets a new piece of information, it has to update that information state. So that's the picture. And so, yeah. So in, uh, in the, uh, So to begin with, what we'll do is we'll ignore the physical state for now. And we'll focus only on the information state. Mm -hmm. And th so this is. Right. In the previous slide, uh, to the, no, the one with the, that one, yeah. To clarify the, uh, the, the graphs, those are probability distributions. This one, yeah. Over depth? Yeah. So, yeah, you can think of these two as these two points. I don't know where it is. Yeah. So for. Um, uh, so first, we'll ignore all the physical state, and we'll just say um, uh, we'll just focus on information state. This amounts to ignoring the motion constraints, the time cost it takes to go from one place to another, and we'll first learn about how to model the information state. That is my view of the world, and uh, then we'll go to given this information state, how and what would we want to sample, uh, and uh, given that we have sampled, how do I update the information state? Now, once we've done all that, we'll give a generic adaptive sampling algorithm. Uh, that could be used in most of the scenarios that we've said. And uh, as a concluding part in uh, this piece of the talk, uh, we'll also touch upon when adaptive sampling could be better than offline design, which is like designing a priori where to sample and, uh, and not doing it on <coughs> adaptive online. And after we have done all this, we'll add the motion constraints and the multi -age -age. So, So, OK. So a quick recap of what is adaptive sampling. Suppose we have to locate these uh, green dots. Uh, they are somewhere in the region, but they are co-located, and uh, uh, we have to sample. And so, how do we sample? So, one uh, uh, easy design is a priori design. You could uh, do you could do random samples. You can decide some random uh, points in the region where to sample from. If you are lucky, you will get uh, you'll get a hit, uh, and in this case, you win. So, bad luck. Uh, or you could be more intelligent about it, and you can do adaptive. That is, you sample at one point. And based on the information that you get, you decide where to sample next. So in this case, now we've sampled it here. Uh, we didn't get anything, so we pick the next position randomly. And then we keep doing that until we get a hit. And now that we've got a hit, and we already know that 
the green dots are co-located, it might be useful to sample in the nearby region. So you do that and you've got all the regions in sort of less number of samples. So there are advantages of adaptive sampling, as you just saw. So a prior design might be wasteful of resources. It might take too many samples to achieve the same level of accuracy as you want. Uh, whereas a adaptive or sequential design uh, makes use of the information that I acquire in each step and could be more uh, 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 better in my resources are constrained. So now what we'll deal into is a mathematical formulation. In particular, how do we model this information state? So. In the example that we have is the Caldera example. We are interested in modeling. Uh, uh, we are interested in knowing the depth. So uh, we want to. So our information state is the depth profile in, of this region. Uh, but it could be in general. The discussion that we are going to have uh, now in modeling the information state could model concentration, temperature, or any other spatial field of interest. Uh, so, so just consider an example. So this is from a paper here. Uh, where they put 54 uh, temperature sensors in an indoor environment. Uh, these are the locations. And we need to pick certain sensors to get an estimate of the temperature in the room. And uh, we have to pick some of the 54. And one of the part of doing that is we, we need a good model on the measurements <coughs> of these 54 locations. So any suggestions on what a good model might be on this discrete amount of so, <laughs> yeah, graphical model is one uh, because the nearby nodes are more uh, correlated yeah, as opposed to the far. It's widely used in the sensor selection problem. Uh, you yeah. just maximize the temperature information between the. Yep. Mm. So, uh, uh, the nodes by the lines, and the lines are not allowed to cross any obstacles like walls, and then we can say that. Can be directly that are, yeah, are more correlated and that's simple enough that you could just use a causal model. Like so a causal model, like a, the like a modeling of some fairly broad theory solution about the temperatures or whatever. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So all of that are you know, great ideas, but we have much simpler thing, like a multivariate Gaussian. And what you this uh, said about correlations, you can import that in the correlation matrix. Um, as to which which sensor measurement is correlated to which one, but a simple one that uh, they use is uh, just a multivariate Gaussian, which is one specific case of what everyone suggested. Uh, so multivariate Gaussian uh, is given by a distribution like this, and it's parameterized by two quantities. One is the mean vector and the covariance vector. Uh, why it's used over a more general graphical model is would be it's analytically tractable. You know, it's much easier to compute marginal and uh, conditional distributions. Um, so, but in our case, we have like a Caldera example where we want to sense step. We're not just interested in measurements at some discreetly placed sensor locations. We are also interested in locations where no sensor is placed yet. Uh, that is, we, we need a model for measurements at infinitely many locations, uh, which means probably infinitely many random variables. And uh, a Gaussian process is a natural extension of multi uh, multivariate or joint Gaussian distribution to do that. And it has been used in uh, to model various spatial fields like temperature, depth here, concentration, and so on. So let's see what a Gaussian process is. Um, uh, so a Gaussian process is a collection of random variables um, so that any finite number of them is uh, has a joint Gaussian distribution. So here I've plotted an example. So my region of interest is real line from 0 to 10. And so for each x in the 0 to 10, um, f of x is, is this? So for each uh, point in this x, uh, x, x in this 0 to 10, I have a f of x, which is a random variable that is Gaussian distributed. And if I pick any finite number of them, let's say 10 of them, then all 10 of them are jointly Gaussian. Uh, Gaussian distribution is usually specified by two parameters, just like the joint Gaussian distribution was, one is the mean function and the covariance function. So the mean function is just the expected value of f of x. So in this case, it's this blue line, uh, which is the mean. And you have a covariance function. Here I plot the, the purple band is the uh, variance at each of these points. Uh, the picture only shows variance, but there's also covariance between correlation between the samples between the locations. 
so this is a uh, this is a definition of Gaussian process, uh, and our, and our information state, that is our view of the world, uh, will be modeled as a Gaussian process. And the randomness in the process, say in this case, at point eight, say you have large uncertainty versus at point three, you have very less uncertainty. So the randomness in the in this process will model the actual state of the world, that how we perceive the world. We know more information. So in this case, we know more more information about location three, exactly what the what the uh, reality is versus uh, at uh, location eight. So this will be our information state, uh, and. So once we have an uh, information state, we will get samples and we need to incorporate that to update our uh, information state. And that will happen as follows. So let's say we sampled at location x somewhere in this region uh, and the sample value of was f. Then the resulting process will be also be a Gaussian process uh, with some other mean which is, uh, so, so you have a sample data which is uh, sampling location and the sample value. And this, this is the new points that I'm tracking. Uh, so this will be the mean, which depends on the sample value, and a covariance object. So just to sort of show this pictorially, so this is my starting Gaussian process. And let's say I sampled it somewhere here. And then the updated Gaussian process is this. So if you see the mean curve, that shifts, and so does the covariance. And let's say I do another sample. And now the covariance really reduces to, and the, I have a more accurate picture of the mean. So this is how I incorporate samples uh, or new information from the world into updating my information state, which is modeled as a Gaussian process. OK, so one thing that I would like you to note, uh, and I'll come back to this later, note that this variance update that I have does not depend on the sample value. It uh, it only depends on where I sampled, but not the sam what the sample value was. And I'll come back to this a uh, uh, little later. OK, so now uh, we have defined a Gaussian process. Uh, usually, Gaussian process, uh, to define a Gaussian process, it's enough to specify mean and covariance, as I said. And there are many examples of mean and covariance functions. The question is, what mean and covariance function should I choose when I'm modeling these scenarios? So there are many mean and covariance functions that is that are used in the literature. Uh, mean function is assumed to be zero. There is technical reason for that. I won't go into it. Um, uh, but a covariance function has to be some sort of a richer class. So this is a squared exponential. This almost uh, this almost looks like a Gaussian. So that's one uh, very popular one that's used. Another one uh, that is used in this paper is an exponential or a square exponential, which measures the concentration across the line uh, on the sea, on the river floor, I think. Um, and there's another one. Uh, I don't even know what this is, but it measures atmospheric concentration. This is the covariance between two samples. Anyway, so there are many covariance functions in the literature that are used. So. So essentially specify oh, this, okay. Yeah. So essentially specifying covariance function and mean function is enough to uh, give me what the Gaussian process is. But uh, and once I've specified, so uh, my question is: Is this enough to model that we have uh, model our information state? So our information state was uh, the view of the world. So uh, yeah, I guess. Okay, let me phrase it properly. So, so specifying mean and covariance is enough to give me a Gaussian uh, process. But is, do I need to do something more to get my information state, or is this enough? Say, consider these two examples. So the okay. so in so what may happen is that we may not know what the mean and covariance functions are. So in this Caldera example, we may not know what the depth profile is. In this, we may not know what the concentration is. We may not even know uh, how, how the concentration levels at two different points are correlated, um, and so forth. So, so how do we get out of this? Uh, the way out is to impose a model on the covariance itself. Uh, and this is done with hyperparameters. So you have a parameterized covariance function. So for example, this is an example of covariance function that we just saw. Here, sigma f, matrix M, and sigma n are, hy are what are called hyperparameters. And this is another covariance function, uh, which only depends on theta. Here, theta is an hyperparameter. 
in general, you have a covariance function that is parameterized by certain theta. Uh, theta could be multidimensional. And the model for our information state, because we don't know what the covariance and mean functions are, is to add a distribution of hyperparameters. So this is how our information state looks like. So you have some hyperparameters on which there is some distribution. Given the hyperparameters, uh, uh, there is a functional dependence on mean and covariance. So given a hyperparameters, I know what the mean and covariance is. And given what the mean and covariance is, I know what my information state, which is modeled as a Gaussian process is. So this is how we will model information state uh, throughout. Okay, so let's just pause and recall as to what we've done. We wanted to do adaptive sampling, and we saw in our picture uh, uh, the glider moving in the caldera example. Uh, it had information state, which is the view of the world, and the physical state. We said, let's ignore the physical state for now, uh, and we thought, uh, and do adaptive sampling on, uh, say, information state. Uh, we s model information state as a Gaussian process. A Gaussian process was characterized by mean and covariance. We saw how to update it, and we also saw, because we may not know what the mean and covariance is, we could introduce hyperparameter. <coughs> now what we'll do is we'll give a generic adaptive sampling algorithm as to how to exactly go around sampling in, uh, in these scenarios, and then we apply that algorithm for adaptive sampling for depth uh, in our caldera exam. So, so, so in the adaptive sampling algorithm, the main question is where do I sample next? Uh, so in this in this toy model, uh, uh, so the question would be: uh, so this is my state of the world. I'm more uncertain about my uh, state of the world here at 8 than at 3. So which point do I sample? So you define what is called an acquisition function. An acquisition function is defined over this uh, space of interest, in this case 0 to 8. And it quantifies how good uh, a sample is would be at a given location. Uh, and what we, you would do is you sample at a point where the ac acquisition function is maximized. Uh, let me make it more concrete by giving a few examples of acquisition functions. So a first example is like entropy of variance. So in, in here what it would mean is the variance here is larger, so I would be better off sampling at uh, here uh, than uh, at say 3 where I already know more, more most, uh, when I know the information. So that is entropy of variance. So that could be one of the acquisition functions. Similar is like mutual information. Uh, I won't give the equation, but uh, uh, so both mutual information and entropy of variance are used when we want to reduce the uncertainty in the uh, 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 in our information state. Uh, because when we sample at higher uncertainty, it will give us more information about the entire state. The third, which we use in our Caldera example, is what we call UCB. It's mean plus variance. That is, we are not just interested in the mean or the entropy. We just uh, uh, we just not in, we're not only interested in the variance. We are also interested in the mean because mean is the depth. So uh, we not so we not only want to reduce uncertainty about the state of the world, but we also want to go to a place where uh, which is the deepest point. Uh, so in this case, the acquisition function will be the mean plus some alpha, which is a constant times acquisition function uh, times variance. So. Yes. Sorry. What is the mutual information we're considering here between what and what? Oh, uh, so the mutual information would be uh, where, I, where I sample versus all the other points that would be of interest. So I would say discretize the rest of the space. And I would, so it will be which places should I sample that gives me most information about okay. everything else. Yeah. So with now that we know uh, uh, where to sample next, let's uh, concretize with that with a uh, uh, description of an algorithm. So here's the generic adaptive sampling algorithm. So you start with the prior information state, something like this, which is a Gaussian process. Uh, 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 and you start with some prior distribution of hy on hyperparameters. Uh, you, have a, you define an acquisition function. Uh, and you iterate uh, on the following. Right? Find the next sample. Uh, which maximize uh, at a location which maximizes uh, uh, the acquisition function. Uh, you sample at that location, get y star. Uh, based on the sample uh, sampled value and where you sampled, uh, y star, x star, you update the information state, which is the Gaussian process. And then you do a Bayesian update on the hyperparameters. And then you also update the acquisition function. So you can keep doing this, but then you would like to stop. So. Uh, these are just three criteria. Uh, uh, there could be other, or you can do permutation combination of them. Uh, one is 
uh, when uh, so I have some distribution of hyperparameters. Hyperparameters characterize uh, how how uncertain my model is, which is the mean and covariance. So if my hyperparameters hyperparametric distribution is more peak, that is, I know what my theta is, I stop. The other one is like uh, uh, you're given some finitely many samples, like 10 samples, and that's all you can do. You can sample when you've exhausted all 10. And uh, third criteria is uh, when the Gaussian process variance reaches within a tolerance bound. So suppose this variance band reaches like very, uh, the variance at all places is like very small, then you can stop. So this is three of the criteria. Okay, so now this example, now let's just apply this example to the Caldera example, which is for exploring the depth. Uh, for simplicity, we'll not assume any hyperparameters here, and uh, we will stick to a case where we are given maximum number of samples. So the algorithm becomes that. Uh, so you start with the prior Gaussian state. You, s uh, uh, you have uh, an acquisition function, which is mean plus alpha times variance. Uh, and you iterate, uh, that is, you find uh, uh, the location which maximizes the acquisition function, you sample, uh, you update your state of the world, and then you also keep track <coughs> of the deepest point, that is the smallest y star that you have encountered so far. And you stop when uh, you've exhausted the maximum number of samples, and you output the deepest point that you have obtained. So this is uh, also uh, called, I mean, you can think of this as Bayesian optimization. So in Bayesian optimization, you have some function which you try to approximate with a Gaussian uh, process. And uh, yeah, and this uh, acquisition function is called UCB. Uh, we use this throughout when we go to, when we introduce motion constraint, we go from uh, single agent to say multi-agent adaptive sample. I know we'll hear a lot about that on Wednesday. Oh, yeah. What would be an example of a Oh, uh, so I just uh, gave, like you had, uh, uh, say, the uh, covariance matrix, or uh, sorry, the, uh, so how much the my correlation decays across yeah. distance? So that would be, that would be. My second question is, is alpha a hyperparameter? So, uh, um, so alpha is, um, Alpha can be fixed, but there are some cases where alpha is also a hyperparameter. You can, uh, you can put up region optimization on that as well. But as specified, uh, but I guess you do it in some of your. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'm just going to give a few quick examples now that we've covered uh, an actual algorithm for doing uh, adaptive sampling. I'd like to compare this uh, fixed sampling routine, uh, the fixed sampling routine that one might come up with on this 1D example uh, to the 2D Bayesian, or to, sorry, to the also 1D Bayesian optimization routine that Jacques just described. Uh, so the 1D example for this uh, fixed sampling uh, approach, we start with uh, one sample at this location. So you can say our robots at location three, and our fixed policy is just gonna be keep moving forward um, in steps of one, and uh, just take a new sample at every location. Uh, and then what does that look like? So initially, we've assumed, uh, as Rizat said, that the mean function prior on the two key is just zero everywhere. So before we took this sample, uh, our mean was just zero everywhere, and the variance was just some predetermined prior amount. Uh, but then we took this sample, and so now our mean function uh, jumps up here to go through that sample, and we can say our variance is large everywhere. Uh, and the variance is particularly large very close to the sample since that location was kind of surprising, or that value was surprising since the prior was, the mean would be zero everywhere. Uh, and so the variance is quite high in that region. Uh, and this is also an opportunity to look at what uh, UCB looks like when plotted graphically. So if we pick, uh, if you remember the UCB equation is mean plus alpha times uh, variance. And so if we pick alpha equals one, then just the way this graph is plotted, the mean function is the blue curve, and the variance is the uh, width of the purple region. And so with uh, alpha equals one, UCB is just the top border of this purple region. So our acquisition function along each point on X is just wherever the top of this border is. Um, but fixed sampling, you know, I, I already told you the policy we're gonna use is just uh, move forward one step at a time, so the acquisition function doesn't matter. The point is we just move forward, take another sample, 
uh, that greatly changes our mean function. Uh, this is now the most likely kind of model for the environment based on our prior. We take another sample, we update our model, take another sample, another sample. Uh, and you can see now after six samples, we take, oh yeah, so six samples, uh, we've got a pretty good model of the seafloor depth in this 1C example, or in this 1D example. There's still a fair bit of variance over here, a bit of variance in this neighborhood. Uh, but it's very well characterized between where we took the samples um, because the way that the uh, covariance updates work, then the closer you are to an actual sample value, the lower your covariance is. So um, that's how that goes. If we use the algorithm that Rajat just described in the previous slide, where we now uh, sample wherever the maximum of the acquisition function is, then our first sample is going to be at one of these two peaks. Mm -hmm. And those two locations. Oh, sorry. Where was the question? Oh, sorry. Is UCB the multi-armed bandit thing, or is it completely separate? Oh, so UCB uh, stands for upper confidence bound, and it's also used as a function or as a like, heuristic in Monte Carlo tree search. Uh, we aren't going to discuss Monte Carlo tree search because there's another group doing it. It might, well, I will mention it at one point, but it's a useful tool for solving search optimization problems. But yes, it is the same function, but it's, it's kind of just a general function. Uh, as often Selection criteria. We use it here just to select the next point to sample. So it is the multi thing. Yeah. 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 yeah it is that function. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So you'll you'll be reminded of UCB in the future. Anyhow, uh, so in this example, uh, we're going to sample at one of these two peaks. We picked the one on the right. Uh, and now what's interesting about this is since we saw the slope going down, our new model of the environment uh, predicts that the slope. The, the ground's going to kind of going to keep getting shallower in this direction, uh, but now that it sees there's a slope, you know, going up in the other direction, it thinks you know if there's this positive slope heading towards the left, perhaps the deepest point is somewhere over here. And you can see, uh, likewise, the acquisition function is very high towards the left side of the graph because both the mean it predicts is high in that region, and also there's still a fair bit of uncertainty. Uh, versus on the right side, it's very uncertain. So you can imagine the mean function probably goes like way down here or something. But the variance is so high that the acquisition function is actually still quite large in that region. So this is kind of good for our purposes. <coughs> so the acquisition function is high both wherever we predict there's a high mean and there's still some invariance or some variance, uh, or where there's probably not a high mean, but the variance is very large. Uh, and sure enough. As we take the next sample, we take it over here, where we thought it would be really high, but it turns out it's actually shallow. Um, and now our new best bet is just to search over here because we've never been in this area, so maybe that's a good place to go. And you can see with now just four samples, we've already got our mean function very closely follows this little red line, which shows the true depth. Uh, and in only four samples, we've got a pretty decent approximation. If we toss on a fifth sample, you can now see this might be a better model <coughs> of uh, this one for our purposes, even though it's taken fewer samples. So that's kind of this is the advantage of using Bayesian optimization over some fixed rate. So how does that look in the 2D case? So this is a uh, top-down view of our caldera. On the left is the ground truth, what the actual depth is at every location. And on the right is the value of our acquisition function. And this little purple marker is our robot. The two blue Xs represent the local uh, deepest points. Uh, this one, like this valley, is actually a bit deeper than the other one, um, but they're both kind of locally deepest. And now we can see the Bayesian optimization routine. This is using a relatively low value of alpha. Then you can see the interesting behavior is that the next location to sample is always quite close in a global sense to where it previously was. And the reason for that is that it's reading depths on the order of 100 meters, 200 meters, all the way down to like 300 meters. And the prior for this environment was that the depth was zero. So um, basically that there wasn't even an ocean here. Uh, <clears throat> and what that means is that whenever it samples some deep value, it assumes that this depth must be a fairly local phenomena. Um, and so it's probably not this deep far away. And with a low alpha value, it's kind of prioritizing uh, sampling wherever it thinks the mean is high. And so that causes it to keep checking kind of close by locations. And also now, once it's found this local maxima, it kind of just bounces around in the neighborhood because it tries thinking, you know, maybe there's another deeper point nearby. Um, and it just kind of explores locally. But since it's got reached a local maxima, uh, it doesn't actually um, 
really go any further. Uh, conversely, if we do this with a very high, oops, that didn't go forward. If we do this with a very high value for uh, alpha, a very large value, then now it's going to sample wherever uh, it thinks that the variance is highest. So it essentially says, wherever I'm uncertain about what the depth could be, that's like a really good place to go sample. But since its measurements only give it information about like you know a few say meters around it, uh, then it kind of thinks like well you know once I've taken a sample in this location, I kind of have a feel for what's roughly nearby. Uh, but I have no idea what's like over in that corner and that corner and that corner. So I'm just going to you know go wherever I'm uncertain. And it's only after it's explored roughly every little section at least once that it does eventually kind of converge to the deepest point. Now you'll see from this point on it kind of hovers more in this region, so it's trying to characterize that maxima better. Uh, but it, it does a lot before it kind of converges that region. Um, but what this kind of shows is that this uh, alpha value, which also Paul Kaffman in some slides, the literature, well, anyway, uh, it kind of controls this exploitation exploration trade-off, where for low values, it's more conservative. It only goes where it thinks it's quite confident there would be a maxima, versus with very high values, uh, it confidently kind of just scans the whole space until it has, feels like it has a decent picture of the global environment uh, before moving on. So now I'll hand it back to Rajat to take a bit of a more theoretical discussion into uh, adaptive sampling. So, uh, so you look, uh, we started with modeling our information state and we've given a generic adaptive sampling algorithm and we also applied it to a Caldera example to model the uh, to get to the depth, um, but let me just take a small interlude before we add in motion constraint and ask: uh, Is adaptive sampling better than offline design? Because I could have probably designed all the samples better. Uh, at this point, everyone might say yes, uh, but I'll uh, so I'll just help you recall two things about our specific model. One is the uncertainty in our state of the world is characterized by the covariance, that is the band here. Um, and if I see the variance update that we had, um, and the update on the variance, or the covariance, didn't depend on the sample value, uh, but only on where I sampled. So I could have as well determined where to sample and so as to minimize my covariance appropriately. So why wouldn't an offline design work just as well uh, or an adaptive design? Okay, that's because we didn't know what our covariance and mean functions were. Uh, that is, we had some hardware parameters characterizing <coughs> mean and covariance, and there was uncertainty there. So, uh, so adaptive design will be better in the case when the hyper uh, sorry adaptive design will be almost same as offline design when the hyperparameters are fixed and um, so and our goal is to reduce uncertainty that is the variance so uh, let's say our criteria is to uh, sample at points which maximizes entropy that gives us that is it gives us the most information crudely speaking uh, so this is a result. I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, you don't have to worry about the math. So this here, so H is the entropy. Uh, F of X1 to XM are all the sample uh, samples that we have collected. We can collect only N points. So this is the optimal adaptive design. So we want to maximize this entropy. So this is the cost entropy that I get by doing adaptive design. That is, you pick X1, and then using that information, you pick X2, and so on. This is the optimal offline design. Uh, so. In this case, you pick x1, x2 to xm right up, up, right up in advance, uh, and you get this. So obviously, adaptive design performs better than uh, the offline design. But there's a uh, uh, compute an upper bound. Uh, this is not achievable. But what this upper bound says is, so h of theta is entropy over uh, hyperparameters. So more I'm uncertain about un uh, hyperparameters, larger this h of theta is going to be. This quantity is uh, doing offline design for a given hyperparameter. Uh, and then averaging out uh, over the distribution of hyperparameters. Now what happens is, if my uh, distribution of hyperparameters is less certain, that is, I, it's more peak, that is, say, let's say 99% of the um, uh, times I know what theta is going to be, uh, say, it's theta naught or zero or something, then 
my this quantity, uh, my h of theta is going to be very close to 0. And this quantity will equal this quantity. That is, my upper bound is going to be equal to the lower bound. And optimal adaptive sampling will perform as well as the optimal offline sampling. So, so whether adaptive design works better than offline design, it depends on how uncertain I am about the model. So that's the theoretical point here. Uh, it applies to Caldera example. If we are interested in learning the entire depth profile and we don't know what the depth profile is, uh, but it is less to when we are also searching for the deepest point because uh, if you found a very, yeah, because we want to search for the smallest mean uh, and it is not an entropic rate. So anyway, so uh, to sort of conclude this part, so we started with adaptive sampling. Uh, we had a picture with information state and physical state and we ignored the physical state and we did adaptive sampling on information state. We gave an algorithm, uh, a generic adaptive sampling algorithm on the information state, ignoring all the motion constraints. And we applied it to the Caldera example to uh, search for the deepest point. Um, and we also took an interlude to see when adaptive sampling works better than offline design and when the two might be, uh, when you may as well do offline design and not adaptive design. So next, what we are we're going to in introduce motion constraints and uh, see how this plays out there uh, with motion constraints and that and all of that will very nicely culminate into a multi agent adaptive sampling design so i think so 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 when you were talking i was disconcerted because your glider seemed to be teleporting from location right. yes to location so, so you're going to make us happy now. <laughs> right. yes i'm going to suggest that specifically so yeah, now that we have a routine for doing this uh, Bayesian optimization, uh, we're going to ground that a little bit more in this idea of a physical robot that's actually going places and taking samples. Um, so Bayesian optimization for sampling. And so this is just the same algorithm that Rajat was just describing, uh, except that we've kind of uh, made those aspects a bit more explicit. So the first thing we're doing is we're finding the maxima of the acquisition function. Uh, that hasn't changed. Uh, now, what's important is we do have a path to that maxima, and we might need to avoid obstacles if there's obstacles. We haven't been considering that. Um, actually, we're not going to, but that would be important. Uh, now you actually have to physically move to that location and take a sample there. You can't just sample there instantly. Uh, and then, as usual, you update your information state, and then you just repeat this process for as many samples as you have. So just to recall uh, those two examples, they both have problems, in our case, of a physical robot. Uh, so for example, you see how this path, the optimal location kind of <coughs> zigzags a little bit. There's a lot of subtle kind of left-right motions between subsequent points. Uh, if you consider a glider, like the type that Hui uses, they don't have a mechanism for like lateral motion, for example. So they can't just easily maybe take a sample that's like immediately five meters west of them, or to the left of them. Uh, even if they do have a mechanism for that, kind of the point of gliders is uh, they can be very fuel efficient by just traveling in straight lines. So this wouldn't be a very good series of waypoints because it might involve the gliders having to take very kind of long arcs to reach a position that's actually quite close to where they were before. Um, so if you're worried about you know time or battery life, well, those are interrelated. Oh, uh, this could be a problem. Oh. Yeah. So likewise, with this other path, uh, I think you can imagine if you know we have a physical robot taking these samples, by this point, our path quite possibly could be much longer than the lawnmower pattern. Uh, if you consider needing to travel between all of these points, certainly by the end of this, this is an extremely long uh, path. So unless the robot is capable of teleporting uh, between these locations, uh, this isn't going to be a very good sampling routine since we would we could have just done an exhaustive search of the whole area before we'd finished uh, the Bayesian adaptive sampling policy. Uh, yeah, so I mean if this was on the order of kilometers in fact then you know even this first couple jumps uh, could have been very expensive and you know we probably don't have enough time to go from the bottom left to the top right to the top left to the bottom right. Um, these are all very expensive movements but Bayesian optimization by itself does not take any of this into account. So uh, I've kind of already commented uh, a bit on the previous paths, uh, but we still should consider like, you know, when are these good, <coughs> when are these bad, when we might want to use them. Uh, and if we want it to be good for our use case, what more do we need to take into account? Um, so uh, as 
Juan mentioned in his section, if we had an unlimited amount of time and we could take an unlimited number of samples, uh, our best bet might just be a lawnmower. So this is going to show a lawnmower, this is once again the same animation. Um, this has relatively large like legs and the distance between the successive paths is quite large. But you know, if we do it a little bit smaller, then we make sure we cover the whole environment, we don't cover the same place twice. It's, it's about the fastest way we can cover this like uh, rectangular uh, map uh, and get kind of a good model of the whole thing. And if we have unlimited time and unlimited number of samples, why not? Uh, but it is a long path, and it does assume that we're sampling at a very kind of regular frequency uh, along each step. Conversely, if we had an unlimited amount of time, but uh, samples were very limited, that would mean we'd want to gain the maximum possible amount of information from each sample. So ignoring the whole fact that we have to kind of pick this uh, exploration exploitation trade-off of how kind of um, what, what the best model for our environment is. You know, it could be the case that this is our best uh, approach because each sample is very informative, at least according to our acquisition function. So, you know, once again, if we don't care about time, but we just want to characterize our environment in, say, as well as we can after five samples or after ten samples, a path like this might actually be um, a good approach for it. Uh, but we're not really, like in the case of physical robots and the types of sampling that uh, like the oceanographers do, we're usually not in either of those situations. What usually matters the most is that you can take a lot of samples, I'll give some examples of other things, but you only have a limited time to execute the mission, so you're trying to do as uh, well as you can within some time constraints. Uh, or the other realistic situation is that you have both constraints, so you have sample or constraints on the number of samples you can take or um, kind of a cost of taking samples, uh, but you're also limited. But we're going to focus on the slightly simpler case, uh, which is just limited time. So in order to solve this or to improve our algorithm towards a, a physical robot model, uh, we need to take the robot's physical state into account. Uh, so that contains things like the robot location, the robot velocity, what the current uh, battery level is. Uh, it could also take into account the immediate kind of local things that the robot is experiencing, like the water current direction and flow rate. Uh, anything we're kind of interested in or useful in modeling the physical state of the robot and the behavior of the robot, um, all of this would be useful to us. And in even more complicated environments, you know, you might not be able to observe all of these precisely. For example, robot location, if these vessels are, um, like gliders for example, those are underwater. So we don't generally know their location exactly. Um, there's no like GPS underwater, for example. Uh, so there could be uncertainty in these parameters, and we would have to take that into account in the general case. But we're going to go with a simplified uh, 2D, fully observable robot state. So we just have an X and a Y position. Uh, we're not going to worry about uh, any of the other physical features of the robot for now, but those are just more things that you see go into our um, physical model. Uh, we're also going to discretize time and space. This just kind of makes the uh, algorithm a bit more intuitive to understand. Uh, there's not really anything inherent about the algorithm, and we will give hints later on as to how you would extend this to like a continuous time and space uh, model, but for pedagogical regions, uh, keep it into kind of a 2D grid and discrete time. Uh, and as uh, we're just going to continue with Rizat's, uh model of the information state is represented by this Gaussian process depth model. Uh, and in particular, like Rajat presented in his last slide, we're going to fix any hyperparameters to some particular values. So for example, uh, the alpha and f-confident and UCB, we're just going to pick a value for alpha and stick with that. And what that means is that our information state is going to be purely determined by what samples we've taken. So the Gaussian process is just um, a representation of what the best model for our samples is um, by these fixed hyperparameters. Uh, so now that we have a model of the robot's, oh, sorry, question. Is there a, like an angle for where the robot is heading? Or? No, we're not going to consider like a uh, robot heading, but this will kind of come into the action model. Uh, so yeah, we're going to assume you know robots in general have a lot of different actions. They're able to move around, but you should consider the fact that they have limited speed and that there are uh, often motion constraints. So actually, this kind of ties into your question. If it's a glider, for example, um, you would consider perhaps a set of motion primitives that are all effectively going straight, but perhaps with just a slight uh, angular deviation. So if you're thinking of, you know, where can I go from my current state to the next state, you'd only consider these points, which are uh, you can get to within a time uh, kind of efficiently. Uh, also, 
robot actions might include using a sensor. So if it's taking a depth measurement, that might be free in the sense that uh, there's no other significant power cost to doing it and it happens pretty much instantly. Uh, there are other sensors that have a limited number of usage uh, uses. So for example, if you're taking water samples, uh, you typically only have a finite number of, or you always only have a finite number of uh, bottles to store those water samples in. So once you take one, you can uh, reuse it. Uh, or you might consider it to be costly in some sense. So for example, if you were going to be picking up rock samples from the seafloor, uh, you're not just going to want to pick up any random rock for no reason, because that's going to increase the weight of your robot, reduce your fuel efficiency. So probably want to associate some kind of cost with that. Uh, once again, we're just going to, for pedagogic, ped pedagogical purposes, go with a very simple robot model. Uh, it can move one unit in any of the cardinal directions per unit time, and uh, it samples depth immediately after every action. So to kind of summarize everything I was just talking about in this state and the action model, we've got a robot state, which is just x, y. We've got an information state, which is uh, our Gaussian process. We've got a set of actions, or action at time t can be any of of that set. We've got physical updates. So if we move north, for example, then our y coordinate increases by one. Oops. And we've got our information update. So every time uh, we take a step, uh, so after every time step, then uh, we just add this new um, measurement taken at location, uh, our new locate. We add the measurement taken at our new location to our set of samples. And uh, here I just presented as updating the samples, but our information state is also updated since it depends only on the samples that we take. So another way of presenting this, uh, if we assume you know we start from some state x, y, and then we're taking actions, would be uh, in this graph. So here's our state at time t, x, t, y, t, with samples s, t. And here's a couple actions that we could take, moving north or moving east. Uh, and there would be more for like south and uh, west, for example. Uh, if you're using motion primitives, you would just replace these with whatever your different motion primitives were. Uh, <coughs> and after we execute these actions, we're now in a new position. So once again, if we move north, our y coordinate increases by one, and we add a sample at that location. And you can also model this further into the future. So if you move east and then north, uh, we're now our x coordinate is increased, our y coordinate is increased. We now have all the samples we had in this state, as well as now another sample from this new location. So I'm going to ask some questions about this model. First of all, uh, is this, as I've presented it, kind of described how you extend it, uh, a graph or a tree? Sure, it looks like a tree. Yeah, I've definitely drawn it like a tree. Uh, remember, OK, so this is a clue. A tree is a directed acyclic graph. No, that's not true. A tree isn't a directed acyclic graph. OK, well, sorry. I'll, I'll ask, is it a directed acyclic graph? Uh, also, is it well, it's not uh, Oh, sorry. Well, I, I should probably draw it as directed. So these states, <laughs> since time always increases, it can't go up the tree. It can't time travel. So there should be directions going down, if that helps. OK, any questions? We'll make the problem set easier if you guys participate. <laughs> no? OK, so I'm just going to give my answer, which is that uh, it's not a tree. It is a graph. Um, Think of, for example, if you, because it has uh, cycles. So if it just moves in a uh, circle forever, for example, uh, once it's completed the circle once, it now has all of the um, samples it's going to collect along those positions around the circle. Uh, it's been in all of those physical locations before. So if it just keeps cycling around the same set of positions, it's eventually not going to be gaining any new information. Its model of the world isn't going to be changing. Its physical state is going to be one of the ones it's been in before. Uh, so there are kind of cycles. Next question, are there any terminal states? Does this end at any point? I have a question. Oh, um, okay, yeah, sorry, starting with. Uh, sure. the, when you say x t plus one, do you mean x t plus one and like y t plus one? Or like are you, yeah, it's the are you modeling this as just being like time steps of all time? Like, I think I see what you're saying. So, like sorry, what I'm trying to say here is that if I take this action, my y sub t plus 1, so my y position at t plus 1, will be my y position <coughs> at t plus 1. Right. I'm, I'm a bit uh, the, is the, doesn't this mean then that this is kind of a limited formulation? Just because the. Uh, like, it's discrete time? 
No, not discrete time, but it's discrete space as well. Like in discrete velocity. Oh, sure. Well, so if you if you replaced, you know, like north, east, south with um, motion primitives, then you could get out of discrete space into continuous space, um, although it would still be based on you know, what you're modeling motion primitives as. You can also, I'll mention this later, but you could model the time it takes to execute an action so that instead of all being on the same row, so all of these actions happening or these states being reached at t plus one, you could have some actions take longer than others. So the length of these um, steps or the heights of them or whatever could be different. Um, so you can definitely extend this model, but yeah, as it is, it's very limited. Sorry, did you have a question? Or an oh, answer? I was just going to answer your question. Yes. Uh, yes. So assuming you don't run out of time and you don't fall into fits, okay. it would be yeah. out. There you go. So yeah, at the moment we're not worried about falling into fits, but uh, I would consider there to be terminal states since we're assuming a time limit. So this graph, you can only draw it so far down before you reach your time limit, and then you can't take any more actions because you're in the time. Uh, next, is there a goal state? I'm running a bit shy on time, so I'm just going to answer that. Um, I would say no, be simply because we haven't defined one, and I don't think there's an immediately obvious particular goal state. Um, you could perhaps say something like sa after you've sampled at every location, that might be a goal state if you're trying to <coughs> perfectly characterize your environment or at least to the best of your abilities. It is really natural that you want to be able to be in a particular place. Yeah, actually that would be a good goal state, to be at a particular location by the end. Uh, and that's something you should definitely incorporate. Uh, yeah, picking up biters is uh, important. You don't just let them run off and lose them. Uh, we're not going to consider that here, but that is something you want to take into account in your problem formulation. So you'd probably have a trade-off between your adaptive sampling routine of um, you know where you're going to sample next and your list of samples you're going to take, uh, as well as still making sure that you leave enough time to get back to your end location. This sounds a lot like um, temporal planning, temporal networks, uh, the stuff we covered at the beginning of the course. Uh, and last question is, how should we pick an action at each time step? And so I'm not going to answer that, because that's what we're going to discuss next. So uh, I'm going to kind of jump back. This is going to be quite familiar to people who have taken 413, uh, which was the predecessor to this course, uh, and see what you remember about Markov decision processes. So recall in a Markov decision process, we have a set of states that we can be in. We have a set of actions that we can take at each state, or it might be different depending on what state. We have a transition relation, which describes if we're in a particular state and we take a particular action, what state do we get to next? And we have a reward function. And so we should note that the graph that I presented on the previous slide shows all of these things. It shows where, what the states are, it shows the actions we can take, and it shows where we go from taking an action. But there was no <coughs> reward function. So one natural way we might consider then developing a uh, policy of choosing where to go next and where to sample next is to define some kind of reward function. So does anyone have any suggestions on what the reward function should be? Or what one could be? So in keeping with our theme of, uh, or in kind of keeping it in line with our, yes? Yeah, like maximum sample inform uh, information from sampling? Or yeah, and did we have some data. kind of metric on where we gain the maximal information? Some function? Was the acquisition function? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what if we use the acquisition function? So the acquisition function is supposed to be some kind of heuristic for how much, uh, how valuable it would be to acquire uh, a sample at a particular location. So if we set the reward of taking an action to be um, the value of the acquisition function at the location we wind up in, um, that seems pretty good. And in particular, we could extend this, um, you know, if we take a particular path through the tree, kind of add up the amount of reward you'd be getting, and so we're kind of maximizing the total acquisition function. It seems like it should work. So let's consider, you know, you're just at this state and you're trying to pick which of these actions is best. So you're looking among your children and you're deciding which one. Uh, the acquisition function for this action, or the reward for this action in this example, would be whatever the acquisition function is at the location you wind up in based on the samples <coughs> that you currently have. And if you take this approach, uh, it looks like this. So we're assuming the robot starts in this location, and it can decide to move either left or right by one unit. So it's going to look at the acquisition function, which is uh, this yellow line, uh, if you have trouble seeing it, it's the top of the purple region, uh, and it's going to move to wherever it's maximized. It's that late. OK, here we go. This is better. So here's the first green mark, and there's the second green mark. So you can see first it, oops, I'm just going to do this one by one. So first it chooses to go down. That's because it's the same on both sides um, at this point. So it's, they're kind of equally likely. So we choose to go right. 
And now, uh, it thinks it's, okay, it's getting shallower, so this is a bad direction to go in. I can choose between these two locations. Um, I'm going to go back to where I was before. So it moves back to where it was before, and now clearly this the acquisition function at this location, which is somewhere up here, is much better than what it is down there, so it samples up here. And now it sees, okay, I'm on a positive slope, let's keep going left, so this looks promising, so the acquisition function is way up here, and it goes higher. Problem is now the it's found it's actually shallower, it's not very happy, um, so it doesn't want to keep going deeper, it goes back up here. And now it gets to choose between these two points, and at this point can I see a problem? Yes? The one on the left is higher. Yeah, so the location it was just at has a higher value than uh, the one it was at before. Even if this one was slightly higher, this one's definitely going to be lower than this one. So we're stuck in a local maximum. Uh, and in fact, yes, we'll keep bouncing back and forth between those two locations. Um, it's in a local maximum. And this happens because we're only planning our next action. So we can extend this to evaluating paths. So instead of looking at just the reward of our next action, we can look at the reward of taking a sequence of actions. Um, but can anyone see a problem with this? No, no, it's way it. And since we're short on time, I'll just answer my own question. The challenge is the reward of taking this action from this state depends on the samples that we've taken, uh, like the sample we have when we're in this state. And we don't know what that sample will be until we are actually in that location and we actually take a sample at that location. So does that make kind of sense to everyone? I see some nodding. OK, great. So yeah, we, we're kind of trying to plan it the future, but you know, depending on what we sample, it will change. It's essentially, the whole reason why we're doing adaptive sampling in the first place is that we don't know how to compute a good offline path, because uh, we don't know what we'll sample. So instead, we can use the expectation of uh, what we're going to sample, so what our new kind of set of samples will be. And the way we can do that is just use the Gaussian process model, the mean function in particular, which is our best guess of what the depth will be at any given location. Uh, and we can kind of simulate, okay, let's pretend we go there and we take a sample. It'll probably be what the mean function says. Um, so let's pass that into our model and then consider the reward from there. <coughs> and now if we do this, for example, with a five step look ahead, so now we're considering um, the next five actions we could take. Let's get all my animations so starting at the end. Uh, we can see it now chooses to go right. At this point, it kind of makes the same decision. Oh, actually, oh, so I guess when it goes five more to the right, that's where these are high. And anyway, so it chooses to go right. At this point, um, it chooses to go right again. It chooses to go right again. Now, at this point, it starts to think the uncertainty over here is pretty high, so it starts to migrate to the left. Uh, and this policy is much less likely to get stuck into local optima. Um, Although, if you think about it, it's not really much different from the previous state or previous situation because we're only looking five steps into the future. So, you know, if our steps were like five times smaller, then it's probably going to get stuck in the same local optima that it would for a one step look ahead. But at least we have a way of improving the performance so that we're less likely to get stuck into local optima. Yes? Is there a way to, like, um, or do these methods usually like add additional weights to questions that are easy to require? Like, oh, this? yeah. So when you say easy to acquire, at the moment we're assuming that it's easy, easy, equally easy to move one unit left or one unit right. Um, if I consider, okay, oh yeah, that's the algorithm. So if I consider, uh, you know, we're making decisions based on the reward function, I could augment the reward function by saying maybe if there's a cost to changing direction, um, the reward of taking a sample when I'm heading in one direction, you know, behind me kind of, like, I could artificially make it worse. So like this, Specifically in this example, oh, yes. you can get a lot of information by taking the bus to the right. Mm -hmm. Maybe more information by taking five steps to the left. Right. Do you, would you rate the one step to the right higher? You know, you might ah, the yeah, yeah. So the way we formulate the reward function here is it's the sum of the path along the tree. So yeah, if we have to take a bunch of crappy samples, like say that we've areas we've already been to on our way to a really good sample, it will take that into account versus, you know, I can easily just move one step to the right and get a good sample. Um, but yeah, you, there is, you do have to have some caution in how you design this reward function or how you accumulate as you move to the tree. Um, there's definitely a lot of choices you can make here and it will affect your performance. Uh, that's like getting stuck in the block versus the block optima. Uh, I'm gonna discuss that a bit more in some slides. So I'm gonna go through this quickly because it's essentially the same algorithm that Rajat presented. Um, although it's just now based more on this tree, which incorporates our action model. So from an initial state, we consider all of our possible moves. We simulate that move. 
we increase our reward based on the reward function, so the acquisition function, for taking that, getting to that new state. We sim simulate a sample at that location, and then we then repeat this for all the actions available at our new state uh, to some depth limit of how far into the future we're looking. And then we accumulate the, we increase the accumulated reward at any given state by the best reward uh, among our possible child predictions. So this is actually a recursive algorithm, uh, which I'm not going to labor, but um, kind of once we reach step four, we're essentially solving the optimal move for the subtree. And then once we know the optimal uh, reward for each kind of subtree, we can propagate that up. Uh, the actual algorithm is presented in this Marchant paper, uh, Sequential Bayesian Optimization for Spatiotemporal Monitoring. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting algorithm with a lot of uh, description around it. Oh, and then last of all, we just choose the action of the largest of the so what does that look like? I'm just going to wrap things yeah. up. You go to the multi -agent yeah, we, like we just kind of iterate through this tree. We collect reward from different paths, and we pick the one of the highest. And this model is very good for incorporating constraints. You can remain a safe region. You can limit the height of the tree. You can limit the number of samples if you add in sampling as its own action, instead of just doing it automatically. Now you have to choose when to do a sampling. You can incorporate that. And for continuous time planning, you can add a duration to actions. You can use a richer set of actions like motion primitives. Now, what's the challenges of this? The complexity is high. So for example, with four actions, uh, 10 seconds to execute each action and planning for the next five minutes, that's 10 to the 20 states in your tree, uh, if you want to consider all of them. Uh, you're, not consi you're not guaranteed to find the optimal solution as I presented it, uh, like global optimum, uh, if you truncate this tree, so below the maximum depth of what you could do in your time limit. Uh, I'm not going to get into this, but it is actually, there are other acquisition functions that have been developed that do give you some kind of degree of global optimality. In fact, you can even use UCB if you just tweak the algorithm a little bit in other ways to say, for example, add randomness. Um, these all let you get global optimality, but there's uh, competitions about which is the most efficient way um, for your particular problem to be globally to find the globally optimal solution. Uh, and also, yeah, you might want to tweak the reward function, for example, on the robot dynamics or whatnot, but this may be not obvious. So you consider these to kind of be challenges with using sequential data. Uh, and also, I'm just, once again, I'm just going to skip this, but the point is, when the tree gets huge, one way you can more efficiently choose the best action is instead of exhaustively searching through all paths and accumulating the reward, you can use Monte Carlo tree search, um, which is essentially just using game theory, for example, or like games to uh, help you choose the best next action without exploring this entire tree exhaustively, and that's going to be something covered next week. So let's just see what uh, the single agent Bayesian optimization case uh, sequential Bayesian optimization case looks like. You can see the robot uh, kind of wanders around, it explores different locations, the acquisition function changes now that it hasn't explored the left region, then it's still very high over here. Uh, in this particular case, because of the relatively low kappa value, it's kind of stuck in this local optima, but if we ran the simulation longer, then uh, perhaps it would escape. Oops. Yeah. So now let's talk about the multi-agent scenario. So there's actually not a ton to say about this, um, but I'm, that's you know kind of the conclusion here for just some extensions of how you can take advantage of multiple robots. So obviously, if we have multiple robots, you can take more samples. Um, so we should be able to be more efficient about this because we can collect more samples in the same amount of time. But if the agents don't know what each other are up to, then they might decide to sample in the same locations. And this kind of makes sense because uh, <coughs> the acquisition function, if they're using the same one. Uh, you know, once they have a similar model of the environment, they're both going to prioritize, like they're both going to have the same value for new states, so they're going to often pick the same coordinates and kind of overlap. So this but loses the main benefit of adaptive sampling, which is that you choose the next points um, intelligently based on what you've observed. So the problem is you can't do that if you don't know what your friends are. So multi-agent sampling policies are essentially just ways to do the single agent uh, policies, but with um, multiple agents sharing information so that they don't overlap. Uh, but you want to do that using minimal communication because some environments like underwater, for example, have very tight bandwidth requirements. Acoustic comms is like 30 kilobits per second. Um, and also, if you're using a lot of bandwidth, then you, maybe you have enough capacity for three robots, but you're probably not going to have enough for 30 or like 300. So there's a bit of a spectrum here of different approaches you could take uh, based on how much communication budget you kind of have available. Obviously, if there's no communication, you're just sampling independently. If there's a little bit, we're going to discuss partition sampling. That's basically you assign each robot its own location, and it just does sequential Bayesian optimization within the region it's assigned. And then these two are more intelligent ways of extending SBO to um, multiple or to multiple agents, uh, and are a bit more centralized because they require 
a bit more coordination, more communication between the agents. So if you consider independent sampling, uh, well, all we're going to see here is that the robots don't really know what each other is doing, or doing so one robot doesn't know when this region's already been sampled, and it's, it's literally just three agents doing SBO at the same time, and we're just looking at what the results are. Uh, but we don't have metrics here on really comparing. For partition sampling, now each robot is constrained to only uh, search these two are limited to the corners, and this guy has the whole top half. Um, and so now you can see there's some problems here, like, for example, these guys could be helping with this region since the acquisition function kind of <coughs> higher here, but instead we have to wait for this agent to get over there. So it might be helpful if our agents could, you know, go into each other's sections sometimes. And so now let's discuss uh, slightly more intelligent ways. I'll go through this quickly. If you want to do joint Bayesian optimization, you basically just consider in your action planning all of the robot's actions simultaneously. So instead of just considering robot one moves north, robot one moves east, so on and so forth, you consider what if robot one moves north and robot two moves north versus robot one moves north and robot two moves east. What are the kind of total states I would wind up in next? So the obvious problem with this is that now your branching factor is exponential in number of robots that you have. So, you know, if you had four possible actions, <coughs> even just in this two robot case, um, but then with two robots, there's now 16 possible pairs of actions you could choose to take. Uh, your total tree size is now a uh, number of actions to the NT, so exponential in both of those. Doesn't seem practical if you want to use a lot of agents. So to be more in efficient about this, instead in this uh, serial Bayesian optimization, you have the first robot just pick its um, action exactly as in just sequential Bayesian optimization in the single agent case. So that's over and done with. We know what the first robot's going to do. It chooses where to send it. But what we add in is it now tells all of the nearby robots. You can even just say all of the robots, but bear in mind that for Gaussian processes, um, you know, a sample at one location doesn't have much of an impact on what your function is far away. So the important thing is that the nearby robots know kind of what the agent's going to do and where we're going to get a new sample. Now the next robot, or all of the nearby robots, now that they know that this location is going to be sampled, they do the same um, simulation step of kind of pretending they went to that location, took a sample, putting in the sample equal to kind of the expected value for the sample, <coughs> as if they themselves were planning to do. And that kind of makes sense, because they know that someone is going to do it. Um, so they just do their own planning, once again in the sequential Bayesian optimization case, um, but with this artificial sample where they predict what robot one is going to uh, do. And now uh, those robots are going to you know, avoid sampling that same location because they consider it to already be sampled. Uh, and once robot one has actually collected that sample, it's going to tell the nearby robots what the real result was so that they can replace their simulated sample value with what the actual result is. Well, now the advantage of this... Well, you that you're in the overtime now. Oh, okay, sorry. So that's the end of our actual content. Here's just an example of what that looks like. Um, the robots are now aware of where they're going to be sampling. Um, so they don't overlap, but the time complexity or the efficiency of solving it is not any higher than in the single agent case since each robot is still just solving the single agent I don't know problem. if we have two more minutes for the conclusion, or yeah, we can stop here. Yeah, this is just the only slide. I mean, it's... <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, so just uh, two more minutes. Uh, so what we saw today, what we wanted to kind of demonstrate is what sampling is and how it is useful. We talked about <laughs> fixed versus adaptive sampling. And uh, we learned that the more uncertain we are about the model parameters, the more effective adaptive sampling would be. We, want, we showed you how we first account for the information state. We kind of showed you how we build a model of the world. And then we then continued with demonstrating wh what, we, what we, we need to uh, take into account when we actually want to take the physical limitations of the robot. And we shortly discussed the multi-agent aspect of this adaptive sampling and the challenges and opportunities that, are, that arise when we work with multi-agents. And everybody was keeps, uh, kept saying, what we implemented, we implemented, we chose. What we actually meant is that we started by actually implementing this approach and this Caldera simulation, uh, uh, Caldera exploration mission. And we uh, and what we'll, you will see in the tutorial is you actually get to, to experience what a sampling mission could be. So we, uh, of course, are, uh, at least most of us are not going to actually explore the caldera. What you need to bear in mind is when you do simulation, 
not you don't know this you are actually seeing the, this which is just the the bottom of the uh, the top of the ocean the view of the, uh, the, the 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 caldera from above and you need to decide where to sample so what will you you will have is a choice uh, is a chance to first explore what a fixed strategy is in this context and how effective it may be not taking into account the physical limitations that's just the information state we will explore fixed versus adaptive sampling in this context and then we want to account for the physical state. So we'll incorporate uh, uh, Stuart, uh, the, the physical uh, model that Stuart mentioned into our model, <coughs> taking into account the fact that we have to account for the, the physical limitations of the <coughs> robot. And finally, we will let you explore what multi-adaptive sampling, uh, multi-agent <coughs> sampling means. So we'll have multiple agents exploring each their separate uh, regions and then exploring together and trying to coordinate their behavior. And this is going to also uh, be part of the uh, uh, problem set that you'll explore. So ho hopefully you'll know all about how exciting uh, uh, sampling can be and multi in, in the context of multi-agent settings. So Good. thank you. Okay, for the sake of time, um, you can talk to the speakers. If you have any additional questions, so please pass in your form. <coughs> and there's no class on Monday, right? There's no class on and Monday. And it's not turned into Tuesday. It's not, there's also we'll no. See you on Tuesday Wednesday. is also a holiday. Tuesday is a Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday is also, I believe, a holiday. Yeah, it's also a holiday. Yeah, yeah. I actually uh, yeah. 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 I did it today yeah. in our lab. Yeah. And they actually showed me the, uh, the underwater exploration missions that they worked on. Thank you. Wow. So I can't really say. Yeah.